Well, good morning. Let me ask you to take your Bibles, please, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, let me express my word of thanks for you being here for our conference. I believe this is the 28th year uh, that we have done a conference, and I think it actually might be the 29th conference, because one year when we shifted, we started in March, and then we shifted one year to the fall, and instead of going 18 months without it, we actually uh, did a, another one right in the fall. So it's been a long time. Originally started uh, as the Mid-America Conference on Preaching, because in the early 90s, um, really the burden was to try and raise the raise the banner about expositional preaching and encourage folks that and and uh, I think we were so effective it really just happened you know so no just kidding uh, obviously that's been I think a great uh, renewal uh, not not just uh, in terms of our conference but I think I think there's generally uh, among conservative bible believing uh, church men I think there's a greater emphasis on the expositional handling of Scripture. Uh, and then a few years ago, we switched to E3. And, and the, the three, three E's uh, are encourage, equip, and engage. And, and really the focus is uh, not different in the sense from the preceding conference. It just gave us the, the flexibility to be able to tackle more directly and more probably more honestly, right, because we have Mid-America Conference on preaching with all these themes that weren't about preaching, and so we decided we, you know, we probably just need to own that and, and shift the focus, but it always is intended to be to encourage the heart, to equip the hands, and engage the mind. That's the, those are the three. So we know folks come, uh, you know, sometimes weary from ministry and just need the encouragement of God's Word, of fellowship together, of, of uh, we hope, uh, really encouraging hospitality and care. And so uh, if we can do anything to make the conference for you better, helpful in that regard, I hope you'll let us know. We want to do that. Uh, we, we're trying to uh, get you resources that will be an encouragement to you and help to you and, and do that in a way that, that uh, you'll come away from the time refreshed. That's our desire and so I hope you'll let us serve you in any way that we can in that regard, and we love to. One of the ways that I try to do it is by giving out some books, and, and I was actually going to ask, how, how many of you have a pastor friend that's discouraged? But then I thought, that's probably going to be everybody, right? So then I was sitting here thinking, you know, Carrie Allen really loves Spurgeon, and I know his friend is with him must be discouraged, because you're with Carrie, right? So here, I've got this book for you guys. <laughs> Spurgeon's Sorrows, all right? It's a, a book intended to uh, help and focus on that, and so I wanted to give that to you as well. Just attempt to try to be a joker, which didn't work very well. So <laughs> that's why I shouldn't attempt to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, I'd like to, uh, before we actually look into the text, just talk a little bit about the theme for this text, uh, for, for our conference, the Missionary Church. Uh, the, the goal in trying to communicate that, the particular angle on the topic of missions, is that we should think of missions not as a program of the church, but as actually the heartbeat of the church, right? And, and so sometimes what we can do is we can think, well, we've got a missions program, and in so doing, sort of put a, a little bit of a distance between what missions is and what we're doing. And, and uh, what I would be inclined to try and argue is that all of us are involved in the Great Commission. The Great Commission wasn't just for missionaries. It was given to the disciples of Jesus Christ, the followers of Christ, and is to go on until the end of the age. Right. So it wasn't just the 11 that he was commissioning, it was all of us, because they weren't going to be around to the end of the age, right? And when you look at what happens in the book of Acts, and the epistles confirm it, that the church itself is a missionary entity, right? That's, that's, that's its DNA. And, and so that we should be thinking about it in that way, so that we can uh, be biblically and, uh, and, and doctrinally driven properly, but, but also we can fight against the almost uh, 
inevitable tendency to tilt toward ingrownness. Right? We, when a church starts, it starts with a very aggressive need to become self-supporting, self-governing, right? It, it, it sort of focuses on its mission in its community, but, but it can very easily become then something that exists for itself, right? And, and now be gauged by the things that it provides for believers and, and essentially have everything start to turn, uh, even if it's slightly inward, in a way that now sort of can compensate for that by being a big missions church, right? Which says, well, we've got a lot of missionaries. We give a bunch of money to missions, right? And that sort of offsets the fact that essentially the philosophy of the church has become centripetal rather than centrifugal, right? That all of, the, all of the force is pulling people toward the church inside so that it can grow bigger and bigger rather than seeing the expansion of the gospel continue in the community in which it is, in the region around it, and then to the ends of the earth, right? And, and so that's, that's basically why uh, we, we adopted that title for the conference, the Missionary Church, and I hope over the course of, of the time here that that, um, that will, be, uh, will be evident, biblically defended, uh, practically uh, laid out, not just to be thinking of how do we do a better job serving our missionaries, that's absolutely a part of it, right, but also how do we do a better job being missionaries, how do we do a better job seeing the mission field that's still around us, near and far. It's not an either or, it's a both and, I believe. And so, so that's the way we'd be focusing on it. We all must engage in the mission of Jesus Christ to build his church. That's why we're here. The way I like to say it is, that's why the sun came up today. Right? Christ is still building his church. When he's done, things are going to change significantly, right? So, so we're here called out of the world, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. A very essential part of that, uh, that's Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4 would be, say, functioning in the body for the working of Christ to build that. And so we need to think that way, I believe. And, and yet, like many things in the church, um, we particularly, and, and I, obviously this is my context, is American Christianity, right? I think it's plagued by personal pietism and ministerial entrepreneurism, right? And what I mean by those two things are that if somebody says, God wants me to do it, that's like the ultimate Trump card, right? How, how do you argue with that? God, God called them to do it. God wants them to do it. And their pipeline with God sort of dominates it. And so what's happening is often uh, shaped by the individual pietistic impulses of people in our culture, right? And it's been so for more than a century, probably fully a century and a half or so. The other side of that is what I called uh, ministerial entrepreneurism, which means if, if a person is dynamic enough and creative enough and can find funding for it, anything goes. Right? You can call it a ministry, tell people God told you to do it, raise money for it, it's going to happen. And the net result is that all kinds of things get green-lighted as missions, right? As, as ministry that, that is going forward because it's just driven by individualistic kinds of, of approaches like this. And practically, the local church is marginalized in the process because the individual drives it and funding drives it. 
And those aren't necessarily tied to the local assembly. And that trend isn't going away, right? It's actually becoming more and more common to bypass the local church to fund what you want to do for Jesus. And therefore, it means it's not tethered to uh, the accountability of the local church in that regard. It's sort of a privatization of the Great Commission that I think is unbiblical and impractical. And so I think we, we need to think about that and wrestle through that. And, and I'd like us to look at a passage of Scripture that I think has uh, profound truth in it that also has implications for us and applications to this issue. And, and if I were to sort of put it under a little more of a formal way of what I'm going to drive at, the reason I'm pushing this way, I'd put it this way, is that a weak ecclesiology inevitably produces a flawed missiology. Right? So if your ecclesiology is off, then your missiology will be off. Right? And the two things I describe, the sort of pietistic individualism that drives missions and the entrepreneurial spirit that sometimes drives it, are both reflectives of a weakened ecclesiology. And, and therefore it produces, I think, a flawed missiology. And so I'd like to look at a passage of scripture that may be familiar to us, hopefully not so familiar that, that uh, we're blinded to it. And I think this passage can help us in at least three ways. It reminds us that the master, not his ministers, calls the shots, right? So it's Jesus that's in charge, not us. It warns us about letting human wisdom push aside or supersede biblical truth. And it also reinforces, I think, the true focus of Great Commission ministry. So I'm not going to look at this entire passage, but I'd like to read it for the sake of context, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not a yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus. Are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in, or I think could be among you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. So I'd like us to look, really uh, draw our attention to verses 5 through 17 as the primary uh, focal point. And the plan this morning in this session is to walk through the passage to see God's answers to their flawed thinking, then take and zero in on, I think, I, what I believe are some critical missions implications of this passage, and then, and then f finish by highlighting two contemporary dangers, I think, in a, our approach to missions. So look if you would begin in verses 5 through 9, because here we see carnal ideas regarding the ministers or, or servants of God. And I'm calling it carnal based on 
what he says at the beginning of the chapter about them being men of flesh and being fleshly. And that's all I mean by their fleshly ideas regarding those who serve. And, and the first indication of that in verse 5 is that they are focusing on the servants instead of the master. All right? Notice 5 says, What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each. And you know the, you know the context here, right? This is actually sits in a passage, uh, actually a unit from the first chapter all the way really through the chap, chapter 4, where, where there's tensions in the church at Corinth that have a visible demonstration by this, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And so, so there, there have these cliques or camps that are there. By the time we come to chapters 3 and 4, we actually are clear that it's really not so much four camps as much as it is probably two, Paul and Apollos, because Cephas and Christ sort of drop out, and now it's talking about who's Paul and who's Apollos. And, and he actually says later, I've applied these things to Apollos and myself, right? So, so it seems to be that the... the the surface level issue is that people are pitting Paul and Apollos against each other. The deeper level probably is the issue between the cross and wisdom, right? Because Apollos has become the spokesperson, probably not according to his desire for the people who want to shift away from the offensive message of the cross. Apollos is more sophisticated, He's, he's more rhetorically gifted, and so that's, they're using him as the excuse for what they want to do, just like the I'm of Paul people are. I mean, it's usually the way it is, is someone just grabs the well-known figurehead to try and advance their own agenda, and that's, that's what's going on here in this passage. And what Paul reminds them, right, instead of using God's servants for their own purpose, they should be recognizing that that's all they actually are, are servants. They're not the master. Right? Who's, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? They are simply servants. That's what he says. They're servants through whom? And I think that, the, that this tendency, right? I almost said at the beginning, uh, you know, we, we've been doing this conference and we're not like one of the big mega conferences, right? I mean, we, we certainly do not have all the sizzle. I hope we supply equal stake, right? But, but reality, I mean, I had one of the guys who start one, I'm just using it illustrative, right? They started one of the big ones, and he told me, we decided to capitalize on the celebrity culture of evangelicalism, right? Get enough big names, and you can draw a crowd. And all I'm saying is that that's, that's a depravity problem, a human problem, right? We we are inclined to make too much of the instruments. We, we find someone who we like as a gifted writer or a gifted speaker or influential person, and, and all of a sudden, they become the focal point, right? They become the, the sort of the bellwether for all that's going on. And, and that, that actually has often very often introduced unhealthy things into the life of God's church, right? Because someone becomes a guru and their view begins to shape a bunch of people and all of a sudden there's a trajectory shift. And, and it's because we've lost sight at times of the fact that, that there is actually no infallible spokesman for Christ post-close of the Scriptures, because the scriptures are the infallible voice of the Lord, right? And, and we certainly need to be teachable, and we should try to learn from good teachers and people who have become practitioners and potentially specialists in helping us think through issues about ministry. And I think this has particular application to this issue of missions because I'm not a missionary in the sense of like, I've never gone, crossed the sea, crossed a culture. So, so I'm dependent on listening and learning from those who've done it. Right? And that's a right and good thing. 
but never to the place of taking what they say and putting it up above this. Because the only way the chief shepherd exercises his authority over the church is through his word. Right? This actually sits above any skillful practitioner or so-called expert of some topic. It always answers to the word of God because the Lord is the one who has to be in charge of his church and the mission. And so, men, we need to trust our Bibles enough to make them the primary, primary authority in all of our decision-making, right? And, and be humble enough to wrestle with what we're interacting with. I'm not in any way trying to dismiss. I'm just trying to say, we, if we're going to privilege something, we must privilege the Scriptures, right? We must give the Word of God the authority it deserves because we don't want to get shifting our focus off to I'm of and then fill in your instrumental voice of ministry and missions or whatever. Right? Well, so-and-so says this and so-and-so says this. And, and essentially, we're not dealing with the primary base for evaluating this. Right? What, what, what does that, what does that say in relationship to what this says, and how do we work through that issue? Right? We've, we've got to guard against that. And in fact, the verses 6 and 7 say that part of their fleshly thinking was that the servants are the source of the success. Right? Verses 6 and 7, I planted a polished water, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. And I'm not going to I'm not going to unpack this as much as I probably would like to, but I just, I'll say pretty quickly, this is not about evangelism. This is about church planting. Right? He's talking historically here. Paul planted, he left, Apollos came in, and he watered, but it was God who was causing the growth. Because uh, if it was evangelism, Paul would be saying, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase, would mean no one came to Christ through Paul which is clearly not what he says, because in chapter 4 he says, I'm your father through the gospel. Right? And and he he tips us off to what's going on in verses 9 and 10 when he says, you are God's field, God's building. So he talks about agriculture in 5 through 9. In 10 and following, he talks about architecture. And he shifts the metaphor by going, you're God's field, you're God's building. And so the planting that Paul did parallels the wise master builder who laid a foundation right and what he's saying is this is that the church that was established through the gospel at Corinth yes I planted it Apollos watered it but it was God who caused it to grow the one who should be credited with this is God himself right and and I think uh, I think We'd all affirm that, right? But there is a deep, there's, there's sort of a deep thread of, of, of dangerous theology that, that operates by this sort of deal, is that when God uses somebody to accomplish something, right, we start to attribute the success to the instrument used, and then we elevate that instrument too highly. Right? I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that explains, I think, some of the reasons why you have, you have sometimes the loyalties built to people who built a big church or did some great thing, and all of a sudden it becomes, you know, it, it becomes an entire uh, industry around promoting them and their materials and their way of doing it and their strategies, and all of a sudden, it, it becomes like, well, look what we did. And you can do it too, because you know, we're great on franchises in America. Right? So here's our notebook about how to build your franchise. And all of a sudden it becomes a strategically driven promotion of a person when Paul's saying, like, who are we? We're just servants. I did my job. Apollos did his job. It was God, actually, who accomplished this. It was God who did this. 
And the man-centeredness of the Corinthians, I think, was, wasn't restricted to how they were reshaping the message, but also in the way they were attributing to the human instruments what only could be credited to God. And, and, and therefore, it's, it's, uh, it, it's fleshliness, right? And that's why probably at the beginning it was uh, the jealousy and strife he mentions in chapter 3, right? Because the thing that starts to argue for one person being better than another person, right, is strife and jealousy. Yeah, I mean, the worst, the most hilarious one I remember back in college, I used to do an internship at a church in Clemson, and and there was a, another guy that was doing it, and he was actually a grad, it's not, it's not a school, it's even in existence anymore, but he was like sort of in the, in the Hiles orbit of life. And, and, and uh, you know, we we're talking back and forth, and he looks at me, he goes, he goes, Hiles can take those Jones boys to the hoop when it comes to preaching. Right, I was sort of like, and I, I started looking at him like, seriously, that's the way you're describing it? Right, like it's a competition as to who's the better preachers, right? But, but sometimes, sometimes that can creep into us, right? Well, yeah, what about this? What about that? And what, what the negative side we probably recognize as bad, right? If we're starting to tear people down because of strife and jealousy, we recognize it as bad. But what we might not recognize is how much we're inclined to privilege right, the one we're favorable to, to the place that it shapes our thinking in ways that, that shifts us away from focus and obedience, right? And so we need to guard ourselves against that. A preoccupation with immediate visible success tends to exalt models above the master. And love for models that work, all right, and we, we shouldn't be looking for models that don't work, all right? But when we fall in love with models that work, it can easily begin to drift away from faithfulness, right? Start to push us from faithfulness in the pursuit of replication of the model that works. Hey, they do this, and it's working, so let's do the thing that's working, and, and, and all of a sudden, required of stewards that we be found trustworthy starts to get shifted toward, well, we want to be successful, and this is working, right? So we, we have to think about that and be careful that we don't, we don't drift in it. Then look at verses 8 and 9, because also I think their carnal mindset here about the servants was that they were focusing or they were forgetting that the servants were under God's command. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. I think the emphasis here is, right, they're, they're, they're actually united in verse 8, right? Now he who plants and he who waters are one. He's saying basically, so guys, you're, you're, you're acting like Paul and Apollos aren't on the same team here. We're actually one. We're, we're both committed to the same thing, which is to do the thing God gave us to do. Right? Paul was a planter. Apollos was a waterer. There was no conflict between them. There actually was unity between them about what was going on. They both saw themselves as under the authority of God. We are God's fellow workers, and we will be given the reward that accords to our own labor, all right? The standard isn't the other guy. The standard is, what have you been entrusted with by God to do? That's the standard of the reward, and, and so they were forgetting that. They were, they were caught up in comparison games that were eventually damaging the health of the church and, I think, therefore threatening the mission of the church in that regard. The, he wants the Corinthians to understand that, that it's God that calls the shots, right? Paul does what he does because that's what God has commanded him to do. And Apollos is doing what God's given him to do. And each of them are going to be accountable to God. That's what 4, 1 through 5 picks up, carries forward, right? We're, we're not 
Paul says those famous words that ought to be really sort of woven in the heart of anyone in ministry, right? It's a little thing that I'm judged of you or of any human court. I don't even know anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who examines me, right? So, so your judgment doesn't matter ultimately. My judgment doesn't matter ultimately. It's the Lord's because he will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. He knows exactly what the state of things is. Right? So, so Paul's prepared to leave his case with the Lord, and he wants them to see that they too need to leave it to the Lord because they're not, Paul and Apollos are not actually the servants ultimately of the Corinthians. They're the servants of the Lord. And, and they, need to, they need to be willing to recognize that. All right, just as the Father commissioned the son, the son commissioned us. So, so it works in that way, and, and we need to see ourselves as servants of God in that way. And anytime we get out of line with that, it inevitably, this might be a strong word, but corrupts to some degree our thinking because we've given some voice more authority than the word of God. And we need, we need to be guarded against that. Then in verses 10 through 15, he talks about carnal ideas regarding the ministry. The, the servants are verses 5 through 9, then actually about the work that's being done, the ministry in 10 through 15. And this is, I think actually this whole passage, I said the thing about our tendency to, to, to be individualistic in our interpretations of things. 10 to 15, my guess is, You've heard it more often preached about individual believers and their service for Christ than you have about God's servants and their responsibility to build up the church. Right? But that's actually what the context is about. It, it, it might have some downstream ramifications to all of us using our gifts the way we ought to use them, but the primary thing he's focusing about is how the work of the church is done. Right, Because you see it, verse 10, he laid a foundation, another is building on it. So Paul, Paul came in and he laid the foundation, now there are other people building upon that foundation. That's why he moves in verses 16 and 17 to talk about the temple of God. And he's not talking about their bodies there, he's talking about the, the church. That it's the temple of God, the spirit of God dwells among them. He's, he's using second person plural. Right? You are the temple. So, so it's about how the ministry of the church is conducted. Uh, probably not being as tight exegetically worded as I'd like to, but let me just take 10 to 13 as the basic point, their carnal idea, was that they could sort of freestyle ministry. They could do it whatever way they wanted to do it. Right? And, and, and it's not that. Ministry must be done God's way. And I think there are two keys to seeing that in verse 10. Paul says, according to the grace of God which was given to me. Right? So Paul says the standard for the work that he did was based on the grace of God that was given to him. It set the parameters for his ministry. Okay, he, he needed to do it in line with the grace that God had given to him. I think he unpacks that more fully in Romans 15 when he talks about the grace of God, which is given to me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, offering up as a priest the gospel, or, or ministering as the priest the gospel of Christ so that the offering up of the Gentiles would be acceptable. Right? So Paul had a commission that he describes as a grace given to him, and that's the standard for how it's to be done. The other, I think, uh, and I don't necessarily hint's the best word, but look at that phrase in verse 10, like a wise master builder. I think you should hear echoes from the discussion about wisdom in chapters 1 and 2. Right? Because he's used wisdom already, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of men, He's talked about the fact that the wisdom of God was not recognized, but, but you are mature and wise. And so when he says, like a wise master builder, I think, I think the, 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 the stuff that's being brought into that statement was, I did it the way I talked to you about doing it. 
right? Don't be controlled by the wisdom of this world. Don't give in to the wisdom of those who are downplaying the cross of Christ. So he, he's talking about, he approached this with a kind of wisdom that came from God so that he could do, he could do the work that he was called to do. It's a distinction between human and divine wisdom. He's not, I think it would be a serious mistake, right? But the kind of mistake that's common. See this like a wise master builder? That means Paul needs, we have to figure out what's the best way to do this and learn from all these things that are in our culture and our society and, 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 you know, sort of integrate them into how we think about ministry, which would be just the opposite of what he's been saying in one and two. Right? Just the opposite. He's saying the wisdom of this world considers the cross to be foolishness. Right? But it's the wisdom of God. And so Paul's saying, listen, I did the work the way God wanted it done. And that's the way the work is supposed to be done. And the reason I say that is look what he moves to a famous text we talk about, verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it will be revealed by fire. So, so if when we think about doing the ministry of Christ, carrying out his work, accomplishing the mission that he's entrusted to us, we can't just do it any way we want to do it or any way we think it might work. We do it based on God's commission and we do it based on the foundation that was laid. And that foundation, he says, is Christ consistently. So, so here's the foundation that was laid. And when you start to build upward, it has to be consistent with that foundation. It's got to be inside of it. Now, um, again, we could take a lot of time to unpack it by re-preaching chapters 1, 2, and 3, but let me just highlight what our probably familiar passage or to you, right? So, so what would be inconsistent with the foundation, right? Changing the message to one that exalts human wisdom and does not confront man's pride. That's what chapter 1 would say. Right, So if all of a sudden the message we preach starts to sound more sophisticated to sinners and doesn't confront their pride, because the point of the cross is so that no one will boast except in the Lord, right? then, then we've actually started to build sideways. Right? If we engage in a ministry that adopts methods that rely on human wisdom, 2, 1 through 5, Right? So we didn't come to you in human wisdom, excellency of speech. Right? So if our approach to the work that God's entrusted to us actually reflects human wisdom, then we've actually started to build inconsistently. Right? We've begun the leaning tower of our ministry. If we use methods that ignore or minimize the effects of human depravity. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Right? So, so if somehow we think the natural man can receive the things of God and can know them, right? then we're actually ignoring what the scriptures say about human depravity. Right? We all of a sudden shifted to an approach that, that assumes that people are not that far from the Lord, and if we can show them the wisdom and attractiveness of it so that it makes sense to them, then clearly they'll come to Jesus. When 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the natural man thinks it's foolishness. He considers it to be foolishness. Right? There is a noetic effect to depravity that shapes the mind of man so that he is in rebellion against the truth of God. And if we adopt strategies that ignore that, right, then we're building inconsistently. Right? And you can read them all. I mean, I, I was prepping for the conference. I was reading a book about 
why we need to do, and I'm not going to say what it is, but here's what we need to do is so we can find common ground with sinners so that our message is more attractive to them and they're more receptive to it. Right? So the thing that keeps this person from coming to Christ is they don't see that we care about what they care about. Right? If, if they understood that we cared about those things, they would be much more receptive to the gospel. As if you have variations of dead. Right? From really dead to mostly dead. All right? and, and so what we do moves them through the variations of death so that they're closer to life. Right? That introduces inconsistencies into the building that are out of shape with the foundation that may not in our lifetime lead to a collapse, but inevitably will become so top-heavy it collapses. And it's happened again and again and again in church history. Right? So, so we need to understand that the, the way in which we're building the ministry has to be consistent with the foundation that we must lay, which is Christ, right? Jesus Christ. And then he says in verses 14 and 15 that not all means are acceptable, right? And, he, and the reason I draw that as an inference is there are some stuff that's going to be burned up, right? And, and, the, and the, the distinction between gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw is not so much, I think, the emphasis on the quality as much as it is the fire test that it'll pass. Wood, hay, and straw will burn up. Gold, silver, and precious stones won't. And, and there's coming a day of accounting to the Lord because it's his work, it's his mission, and what we've done will have to pass that test for the sake of reward. And, and here's the, 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 what I'd say is sort of the, uh, the eschatological orientation that Paul seems clearly to operate by that we need to. It's not actually the present evaluation of success that matters most. Right? Because we could look like we've really done great and it gets to the Bema and it's up in smoke. Because it was done in the ways that chapters 1, 2, and 3 prohibit. I actually didn't get into 3, but if we actually build our ministry by divisiveness, right, then, then it's actually fleshly and also won't be good. Right? And that's sometimes, sometimes what can happen. Right? So, so what we could do here is, is end up with a ministry that has only temporal prosperity and of is of no eternal value in terms of our service for Christ we we've we've in that sense lost our reward and I think that's the point of it. it's not it's not here an issue of saved or not saved it's an issue of reward right he will have reward or he'll suffer loss of reward and and Again, we don't have time to run it, but if your view of justification eliminates any kind of evaluation of your service of Christ, service of Christ, right, then I don't think you're understanding the biblical concept of justification. Your sonship, your standing with the Lord can never be taken away, but you have been given responsibilities to serve him for which we're accountable as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And we should have an eye to that day when we'll see our Savior and want to present to him a work that is composed of gold, silver, and precious stones. Right? Regardless of what anybody on this planet thinks. Right? That's why Paul can say in chapter 4, it's a little thing that I'm judged of you around in human court. Right? Paul was content to have all of those people think he was a loser. Because his ambition was to be pleasing to the Lord. And if he seeks to please men, Galatians 1.10, then he's not the servant of Christ. Right? So he was prepared to take the hit now because he believed that Christ's appraisal of him was the most important one. 
And then verses 16 and 17, they have carnal views of the church, right? And, and I'll say these pretty simply. The church is not ours, it's God's, right? That's what verse 16 is saying. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells among you? Right? So, so this thing you're causing all this ruckus in, this divide in, right? It's not your house. It's God's. It's his temple, and you better recognize that, right? The church is not ours to just decide to do whatever we want to do with it, right? We, we, it's, not, it's not Plato that, that Jesus gave us, here's some Plato, and in every era, in every age, you just get to make it into what you want to that you think is the most effective, right? It's, it's actually God's household, it's the body of Christ. It's God's temple. We are under obligation to do things the way he says to do them. It must be according to his word. That's what, that's what Paul's saying in 1 Timothy 3, right? When he said, writing these things so you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And that clearly is the local church because the things he's describing writing have to do with prayer meetings and leadership in the church, qualifications of pastors, qualifications of deacons. He's not talking about the universal church. He's saying, here's how you should conduct yourself in the church, which is God's house. The assembly or congregation of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. This is a passage in which Paul says, it is God's temple. And so you don't you don't, I mean, obviously we could always say my church, our church, uh, as if we say we're a part of it. It shouldn't be. That's my church, as if I own it, right? That's not, that's not the way we think about it, and we can't serve like that. And then verse 17, it's wrong to think that God doesn't care about how we do this. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. And I think in the context, right, the destruction that's happening to the temple of God is the, the use of these illegitimate means and methods and mindsets. Right? You keep arguing like you're arguing. You keep trying to advocate these shifts that you're advocating. You're going to destroy the temple, and God is going to be opposed to you. Right? You you will face God's dealing with you on it. And again, sometimes, uh, sometimes we miss this, right? I mean, Jesus warned the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 that he would put out their candlestick, right? So he'd set himself against them in a way that would shut down their church if they didn't repent and return. And I think... I think what we need to do, right, our tendency in the Western culture is to think of almost all biblical truth in just purely individualistic framework, right? And not corporate congregational realities, right? So here's what I think happens. Because, because of wonderful truths about our individual personal salvation, like justification, we sometimes transpose those over to the corporate assembly as if God doesn't see the sin in the church that might cause him to put it out of business. But clearly the scriptures show that he does. Jesus says, I'll remove your candlestick. Right? So, so often the judgment that God brings against his people collectively is because collectively they've disregarded the authority of the master and and so we need to recognize the seriousness of that that we can't afford if i go back to where i started we can't afford to start well and then gradually shift away from the mission of jesus christ so that we just become a place that's a provider of spiritual goods and services for people who already know jesus Right, we got something good for their kids. We got a nice something for them to come. They enjoy our services. We're just a commodity broker of spiritual things. 
and we've lost sight of the mission entrusted to us by Jesus Christ. All right, so that's the exposition. Some quick implications, application in the time we have remaining. All right, the first implication I would argue for is that God's word must have active, functional control over our missiology, all right? That, that we need to have that view, including over our view of both the work and the workers, all right? So what we should be doing is as we, if we're shepherds, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of taking that stance that we're pastors, it's a pastor's conference. I know not all of us are pastors, but, but just work with me, all right? So, so I'm a pastor, and I begin to look at the work of missions and the workers in missions the standard can't be effectively to just sort of set the Bible aside and, and just accept them on whatever they claim to be the standard. Right? It actually has to be according to the word. Just like if, you know, if somebody in the church wanted to start some ministry and, and it, was, it was something that wasn't authorized by Scripture and we'd go, well, they say God told us and We'll personally pay for it. Yeah, okay, cool. Right? Most of us wouldn't let that happen at home. But sometimes we're not even paying attention away from home. We're not even looking at it because we just think it's somebody else's job. And I think we can't, we can't do that because it's the mission of the church. And if we're shepherds of the church we're going to be accountable for how we've led and so we can't we can't punt that off to some parachurch organization right it's it's actually the responsibility of the church and i think it needs to be driven by the scriptures i'll tell you the the place that this sort of i mean and i'll i'll say it this way is um is I'm saying it pretty strong now, but I, I say it pretty strong now partly because of sin I repented over. <laughs> right? I, uh, I came to be, back to be the senior pastor 30 years ago, and we didn't really have, we had very little missionary activity, partly because we're carrying, you know, we've got seminary debt, all that kind of stuff. The uh, Lord allowed us to pay off the debt early in my pastorate here, and so I immediately said, we need to, you know, we need to get going on this mission stuff. And, and so um, here's, I mean, to my chagrin, right, I basically started calling mission boards. You guys got missionaries. I sort of figured they put their stamp of approval on this person. They're good. And we just start chucking money. And then problems started to come up, and I started going, um, how did you guys let that happen? Well, it's the local church's responsibility. Oh, so basically... And, and I start watching what's going on and thinking, man, this isn't right. And so, you know, and, and actually to add to my guilt, right, I do my doctoral, my DMIN project on developing a course on philosophy of ministry for a Baptist seminary. So, like, I'm immersed in figuring out how to teach and communicate the philosophy of the church. And about 1994 or so, I go, I have never thought about missions like this. I've never actually tried to think through what our philosophy of missions ought to be. I'm just basically going, hey, if we just, we got people going to the mission field, we'll support them. I knew we should support them better than what usually happens, but, but that was about it. And all of a sudden I'm going, this is not right. And, and then Lord graciously through the 90s, and then really particularly in 1999, we had uh, Rob was leaving to go and so we're having to think through and sort of on the ground and all of a sudden it's like man we've got to do this better instead of offloading it we need to accept responsibility for it right and 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 think about it and learn what we need to learn and keep learning right because it's you know 25 years later and i keep saying every time um we haven't faced this one before so we got to figure this out Right? This is a new situation, so we've got to learn this, right? Because there's always going to be something new if people are going to all different parts of the world and they're facing all kinds of different circumstances. But we need to accept responsibility for it. Because we are actually, if you think about it, right, 
The money that God's people over which you are an overseer are giving to go do this is something that they're accountable for, the church is accountable for. And if you're the leader, an elder, overseer, pastor, you're making decisions about all of those things that that really should be consistent with what you believe about how ministry should be done. It should be an extension of your work, not something different from your work. All right? it, there should be continuity there that's grounded by, by biblical truth. I think as well, and, and I said this a little bit, and I'll probably come back to this again later, but I think the local church is the center of the Great Commission, right? They that Paul planted churches, others are building on it, all of will give an account for how it's being built, right? It's, it's, it's very much local church-centered. And, and I would argue that mission springs from the local church, should result in local churches as in accountable to the local church. That that's, that's, that's a biblical ecclesiology, and that there may be other ministries that come along, right? What I would say is the tendency is as they sort of grow in size and constituency, they actually, instead of being para, which is alongside of, start to become hyper church, right? So churches are looking to and listening to the parachurch ministry about what to do. Well, tell us how we should do this. Get us engaged. And all of a sudden, what started with good intention to just come alongside of has often superseded. And I think that's probably because they shouldn't really be either hyper or para, they really should be hoopa, should be under the church, right? Serving the church. Churches don't exist to serve other organizations. Other organizations exist to serve churches, right? And and we need to own that because I don't think it's always their problem. Right? You know, it's like a bad analogy, perhaps, but, but it's like parents who don't do their job in the spiritual instruction of their kids because they put them into a Christian school and they're expecting the Christian school to do it. Right? They're just basically like, oh, yeah, we put them in a good place. Someone's teaching them the Bible. They're watching out for them. It's all good. And the, and the parents don't do it. Right? Now, is it bad to have them in this? I don't think so. It's bad if you let them become actually the de facto parent, right? And and if it's a worthwhile school, it's not trying to replace you, it's trying to help you. But if you abandon your responsibility, it effectively replaces you whether it's trying to or not. And here's what I'd say, a lot of times us, we in churches, have abandoned our responsibility to somebody else And it's not necessarily their fault that they've replaced us. We've abdicated our responsibility. Here, you tell us if this guy should go to the mission field. You tell us if this guy's qualified. You tell us if this guy's guy's doing his job. Right? We basically have offloaded the responsibility, which is actually ours, because it's centered in the church, and we we need to recognize that. Right? So I think those are necessary implications that have always been, uh, well, well, I shouldn't say always, I think since the 1800s at least, they've been under attack, right? So I'm a big fan of like uh, promoting people, consider missions, but if you go all the way back to like the student volunteer movement in the 1800s, uh, ever since then, the whole missionary recruiting process has sometimes bypassed the local church. And I, and I don't know there's a way to answer it all, but like, so you get a bunch of college kids together, preach them about they should go to missions. You've got mission boards recruiting them to go to missions. And so they go, God's called me. And these people want to help me get to the mission field. And they show up to the church and say, hey, I'm going to Timbuktu. And now the church has got to go, um, no, you're not. And, and depending on the size of the church and scope, it could be deadly to that church to tell them no. Right? Because everyone's going to be mad. What do you mean? And, and actually, it's not so much the problem going to Timbuktu. It's, it's this. I'm going to go help dig wells 
or I'm going to go pass out malaria nets, or I'm going to go, and all of a sudden they're saying things that aren't missions at all. But they're going to be a missionary because they've got a call and they've got somebody that will help them go do it. They're even already coaching them about how to raise support. And they say, but you need to get a church to say you can do it. Because you're actually sent by the church. Right? So effectively, the thing shifts off its axis and is going sideways. Because practically speaking right now, I think missionary is defined by going somewhere other than where you live to do something for Jesus. Doesn't really matter what it is as long as you're doing it for Jesus and you're not living at home. All right, so you're going somewhere to do something for Jesus. And people can say, I'm a missionary. And, and the reality of it is, is that's the shift away from a good ecclesiology to a bad ecclesiology that ends up with a flawed missiology. Right? They don't have, they don't have the centrality there that it ought to, and it's very prevalent. Right? And it's tough. I mean, you know, it, it, I actually don't face it that much anymore, but it's not fun to sit across the desk from somebody who loves Jesus, has had a bunch of people tell them that they should go do this and say, you know, that's really not what we're supposed to be doing. And the church isn't going to do that. We're not going to send you to do that. Right? But if we're shepherds, we should have those conversations sometimes. Because we're supposed to lead, not follow. Right? We're not freestyling the work of Jesus. We're supposed to do what he gave us to do and carry out his work. And so let me encourage you, even as you go through this conference, to, to adopt the spirit of a learner. Right? There are great guys here teaching excellent stuff. And, 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 and all because we want to see this honored right? And let's try to work hard to remember that one day we're going to answer to Christ for how we've led his church. And we want to build with gold, silver, and precious stones, even in what we're doing to take the gospel to the nations. Let's pray together.